Today's lecture is about neural networks and the agenda of uh, this topic is first we'll try to give you some motivation uh, why exactly neural networks are required and in, in that aspect we'll try to cover two different aspects. The first is feature engineering and the second is feature learning. So we will see that uh, some of some part of feature engineering we have already covered like the basics and neural network is kind of basics for feature learning. So we'll try to connect these two uh, concepts and how these are different and how they're trying to solve actually the same problem. Then we'll try to cover some of the basics of neural networks or what exactly these neural networks are and how, how we can actually use them. And then there's a very interesting concept of non-linearity, which is actually used uh, in neural networks, not just neural networks, like any kind of network you have. So we, we'll briefly talk about that. So let's start with uh, the first topic, which is feature engineering versus feature learning. Now, so far in the course, we have seen, uh, given an input image, we can detect edges. Okay, so that's just the beginning. And of course, if the end goal is to actually detect edges, I mean, your problem is solved, but usually like in real world uh, applications, you ideally want more than that, not just detect edges. Okay, so the question is like, okay, once we have detected these edges, where we can go from here? In the previous lectures, we have been talking about filtering. Um, we have studied like how gradients can be used to detect these edges. We try to cover different algorithms to detect edges. So the next step is once we have these edges, can we extract some meaningful features? And by meaningful features, I mean some kind of conceptual representation of your input image. Okay, which will make like make your task easier. Let's say if you are doing image classification, so these features will help you out. Okay, for so for example, like if you are doing image recognition, or it could be scene recognition, place recognition, like there are a lot of uh, other variations. Then these features will be very very useful. And again, if you are doing object detection or action detection or any other detection task, again these features will be useful. It could be segmentation. So whatever variation of computer vision problem you have in your application, you will need these features. Now let's try to understand like uh, at a high level, when we're trying to do object classification, what exactly is happening uh, under the hood? So for example, if this is your image and let's say you have to classify your set of images as whether these are motorcycles or not. So what you'll have to do is your input will be this image. Then you will have some kind of model. You can say, let's say machine learning uh, model, which is going to tell you whether this is motorcycle or not. Okay. So this is like a very basic uh, image classification problem. Now, the problem uh, with the, these kind of models, and we have seen this before as well. So uh, visually we can see like it's a motorcycle and it's very easy for us to, to make like these kind of uh, interpretations. But uh, as we discussed earlier, like, uh, in images, when computer tries to seize these images, if you focus on this patch, the camera or the computer, whatever your algorithm is, it's just seeing this bunch of numbers. And even for us, like as humans, I mean, these numbers, I mean, it's very hard to interpret. There is no way of saying that, okay, these numbers are actually coming from motorcycle or not. Okay, so that's the difficulty. So now let's try to understand how we can resolve this. And we have uh, partially covered this aspect in um, one of the previous lecture as well. So what's the like the very basic thing we could do? If we have this input image, we can represent this image at pixel level. All right, so pixel level means for each pixel, you have three different values if it's RGB image. And you can say that, okay, this pixel has red color, this pixel has green color. So that's like one very crude form of image representation. And you can in fact, create your algorithm just using that representation, but let's see what, what, what are the issues. So let's say we just pick like two pixels and we say that, okay, this is like X axis is pixel one and Y axis is pixel two. And uh, let's say we try to project like the value of that pixel uh, on this axis and also on this axis. And let, let's try to simplify. Let's say it's not RGB, let's, it's just grayscale. So grayscale is easier because RGB is already three dimensional, right? We, we, if you have to project it, it, it becomes a little, little bit complicated. So let's say it's a, a grayscale image. And this X, <clears throat> this, excuse me, this X axis is representing the intensity of that pixel. 
So you know that in a grayscale image, pixel value could be between zero to 255. And this X axis uh, over here, it's marking like what's the intensity of that pixel. For example, like this, uh, one of the pixel of the motorcycle, let's say it's at, it's at this point, and the Y axis is intensity of pixel two. So this is just showing two pixels, but if in your input image, let's say you have thousand of pixels, then you'll have thousand of different dimensions. And you can again, just generalize this idea from two pixels to a lot of pixels. So this will be your first pixel, depending upon what's the intensity of uh, this pixel. And again, this is like another pixel coming from your image. So these two are like motorcycles. And these are some other images, which are, you can see negative images. These are not motorcycles. And for the same set of pixels, the, the values of pixel intensity actually falls at this point for this image and at this point for this image. And we can try to plot like more, su more such images. And what will happen is your, uh, these uh, blue dots here or uh, the blue crosses, these belong to motorcycles and the negative red are kind of non motorcycles, neg neg motorcycles, negative images, right? So this is kind of your distribution, but if you will see like, there is no way of knowing like which of these marks are actually motorcycle and which are not motorcycle. So you can't actually draw a very simple boundary which can divide these two. So that's the difficulty of pixel and that's actually true as well because your pixel color will change depending upon like the orientation, the lighting condition, a lot of different factors there. So clearly pixel based representation is not good. Okay, so how can we improve this? So one simple step could be you can have feature representation, which is actually looking at parts of these images or parts of these objects. Okay, so parts could be, for example, you're looking at, let's say, uh, handlebars, or you, you could be looking at wheels. And so right now, don't worry about how to actually extract wheels or how to extract uh, handlebars, but just try to understand, like, we are moving from pixel level to concept level. Okay, so let's say our feature is, feature representation is focusing on these concepts. And now what we can do is, instead of the axis representing each pixel, these axes are actually representing these concepts. And now let's say X axis is saying handlebar and Y axis is saying wheels. Then if you try to plot like different images, then what will happen is your images from motorbikes will see like they will have handlebars and they will have wheels. So they will fall over here. And then all the negative images, they won't have handlebars and they won't have wheels. Okay, you might have cars as well. In that case, your wheels will go way up right, because they might have four or more wheels here. And again, they won't have handlebars, so they might lie around this region somewhere. But again, you will be able to differentiate those images of cars or four wheelers with your motorcycles. So in this case, if you have such a plot, and again, this is just two dimensional, just two concepts, uh, you might have like a lot of other concepts, it will be like n dimensional space. But the good thing here is, if you just draw a line over here, then what you can see is during test time, if I give you an image, depending upon like where that uh, image lies, whether it's like towards this direction or this direction, you will be able to say this is a motorbike or not. Okay, so this is kind of a fine uh, distribution, which is discriminating or which is help, which is helping you in discriminating between these two uh, type of images. Now, the question is, how do we get these feature representations? And like before deep learning, or you can say like uh, this data-driven approaches, there were a lot of local features which were developed. And these local features, the whole motivation was to actually try to represent these different concepts automatically. And once you have these features, you can use them to, to classify different images or to discriminate different images from, from each other. Okay, so SIFT is one such algorithm. And I think we have a lecture, a complete lecture to talk about the SIF features. We have spin images, we have HOG features, and there are a lot of others. So this is just a small list because earlier, like uh, this is like classical computer vision. So everyone was trying to come up with, the, uh, with these set of classical features. So it's not just like these nine, you will find like a lot of, lot of variations uh, just for, from, for, for these set of features as well. So in the course, I think we are not going to cover all of those uh, because again, it will take a lot of time, but we'll just, try to cover some representative, which, has actually, uh, which are actually very uh, useful, which were performing very good and are still used today. One of uh, 
such features are like SIF features and Atoji features. So we'll try to cover these two. And the rest, I think, yeah, these we are not going to cover. Now, the challenge with uh, these type of algorithms was these were like kind of handcrafted features. You, you'll have to think about like how to extract features like manually and you need expert knowledge for that. And that's a challenge because whatever feature you can derive using these algorithms that is limited by whatever knowledge you have. OK. So that has changed a lot. And I'm not saying these features are bad. These features still have like some very nice properties and people haven't started looking back to like these features, but we have some like ongoing research where we, where we have seen that if we try to integrate like these local features with like the deep learning paradigm, we can like do something much, much better than deep learning. And I, I won't talk like a lot about this because that's like an ongoing research, but ju just to give, in, give you an idea. Okay. So. That those local features, it was all feature engineering, which means you need some kind of domain expertise or some kind of domain knowledge to come up and design these features. Now, these days, like with deep learning, it has converted to feature learning. Okay, so we are not engineering these features uh, in any way. All we are doing is we are trying to learn these features. Okay, and how these features will be learned. Uh, half of this course is actually just focusing on that. And uh, the neural network, the lecture we'll uh, discuss today, it will start with like neural networks that, that's kind of a basic building block of how these features can be learned. Okay, so the feature engineering, uh, as I said, uh, you need some kind of expert knowledge. And for feature learning, all you need is data. As long as you have sufficient amount of data, you can try to learn these features from uh, those data points. Now, talking about data, like this is something ImageNet, all of you might have heard. Uh, this, this is a very large scale image classification data set. And this is like something from where this uh, revolution of deep learning started in 2012. Okay, so it has like a lot of categories, uh, different object categories, uh, roughly around a thousand. And there are a lot of images. Earlier there used to be fewer, but uh, it's actually growing day by day. So uh, right now, roughly you have more than 14 million images. And in the testing set, you have around 100,000 images. So if you think about like those classical algorithms, it wasn't even like feasible to think about, I mean, how will you use that many images to maybe do some kind of feature engineering or how you will like even test uh, all these uh, images. And the reason was the limitation of computation power. Okay, so the idea about learning these features is once we have these lot of lot of samples, we try to learn from this uh, uh, from from this data. So now we'll briefly give you like an overview how this learning process is done. And again, this is all high level. We'll go into detail uh, as we as we move on in uh, deep learning. Okay, so these are just basics. Uh, bear with me. Now the idea is once you have a large scale data set, what you do is you first split that data into some uh, subsets. So usually three subsets. The first one is called training uh, subset. So these are your training images, which means that these are the images which you will use to learn those features, all right? And if you are training, let's say a model, which if it's an image classification problem, you can say that that's a classifier. So these images will be used to train this kind of model. Then the second split is you, you will have validation images. All right? So validation images are, once you have trained your model, then you will try to evaluate that model on these validation images. And then you will see, okay, if the performance is not very good, then you will try to fine tune some of the parameters to improve your model. Okay, so that's the motivation. So you, you won't train on this data, but you can actually take feedback from this data on how well your model is doing. And if it's doing good, you will keep the parameters. If it's doing bad, you will actually try to improve your model. So this is called uh, also fine tuning your model or fine tuning your hyperparameters. Again, we will talk about all those things. Don't have to worry about if you don't understand what a uh, hyperparameter is or what uh, model tuning means. So that, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Now the third set is, this is important. These are testing images. And when you're training your model or when you're trying to learn your features, you will not touch these images at all. Okay. So these are kind of hidden images and the labels will be secret. And eventually when you say that, okay, now I have a perfect model. Then you will use that model to just test on these images. And that will tell you how good your model is doing. 
And ideally what happens is if these are like, uh, you can say like all the data is 100%, usually you may want to split maybe 60% of the data for training, 20% for validation or 20% of uh, 20% of images for testing. So that's just one uh, way to distribute, but you can have variation. Ideally, you want to keep a lot of samples for training. All right. Now let's try to understand like different learning phases uh, when we are training those models on the training data. So these will be your training images and uh, you will extract like some kind of features from these images. We'll talk about how to extract those features. Don't worry about that right now. Once you have those features, you will train your model. So that's called model training. And the way you train your model is you need some kind of labels. And that's also called ground truth, which will help you in training your model. So the idea is, let's say you have an uh, this image. All right, so you extract the features, you train your model, but right now you don't know uh, how good your model is doing. So for that, you need to know this is an image of Apple. Okay, so that's called image label and that's also called ground truth. So then what you will do is whatever your network is predicting, you will try to match that with the label or the ground truth, whether you are able to predict Apple or not. All right, so that's why you need labels and based on how good your model is doing, then you will try to update this network. And once you have uh, finished that process with like the whole data set, you like do a lot of iterations, a lot of rounds uh, of that. And again, don't worry about it. We are going to cover that uh, later uh, in more detail. That's going to give you a trained classifier. All right, so once you have this trained classifier, then you have the testing phase. And right now I'm skipping validation uh, phase. So don't worry about that as well. So we are directly moving to testing phase. During testing, you will take this trained classifier and any image from testing, which you have not seen during training, Again, you process, you, you follow the same process. You extract the features and you take the train model and use the prediction as your result. Okay, so let's briefly talk about like uh, what these image features are. But whatever these features are, you use the same set of uh, algorithm like both during training as well as testing. So these steps will not change. Okay, so features, you can use raw pixels. And of course, if you're not training your model or you're not learning your models, then we, we saw that using raw pixels doesn't make any sense. It won't give you like a good learning, all right? But if you're learning features, then you, ideally using raw features is actually very, very useful. You can use histograms, you can use templates. I think we, we saw that in lecture one, uh, where we're trying to match like uh, templates with your uh, sample image. Or you can use different set of local features uh, which I described like a couple of slides back. And these could be like sub descriptors. These are different variations. Or you can try to learn these features using raw pixel values. All right. So we will cover like two aspects of this. The first one is using local features. So we'll study like how to extract these local features. And the second aspect is how we are going to learn these features. That's like the neural network part of it. All right. So uh, as I said, you need labels uh, to train to train your model. Now, again, to, to better understand what these labels mean, uh, uh, let, let's uh, go a little deeper on that because labels can vary like uh, depending upon what task you are trying to solve. Okay, let's take this example. For example, this is an image of motorbike. If the task is image classification, Right, where you just have to look at this image and say that which object is present. So for that case, when you train your model, your model will make this prediction, right, whether, whether motorcycle is present or not. So to, to estimate how good that prediction is, you need a ground truth or, or a label. So for image classification, all you need is a, a very simple signal or a label which says that whether motorcycle is present in this image or not. So that's called, uh, you can say like image label, uh, label, all right? Or you can just say image label or class label. Okay, so if, you're, if your model is saying motorcycle is present and the ground truth also says motorcycle is present, your happy model is happy, it's doing pretty good. But if the network says this is not a motorcycle, but the ground truth says there was a mo motorcycle, then you say, okay, we are in trouble. The network is not doing good. So do something about it, all right? But uh, what, what we'll go, we are going to do, so again, don't worry about it. All that is coming later. Now, 
if you have to perform object detection, which like one vari a variation is, you will have to draw this kind of bonding box. All right. So in that case, as a ground truth, you will need this kind of bonding box on the image because your model is going to make predictions and saying that, okay, this is the location where motorbike is present. Then to evaluate like whether your model is correct or not, you will need this label. Okay, so for detection, you need bonding boxes. If you want like fine boundary or pixelized segmentation, you might need like this kind of boundary. Or you can also do like very, very fine grain recognition where you are trying to detect, okay, whether this is a motorcycle seat or it's a wheel or it's an engine or it's like a mudguard, something like that. Right? So it's, it's going into more detail. Now you can see that as we are moving away from classification to like a more fine grained uh, detection task, the annotation effort is increasing. All right. Now let's try to understand like what kind of variations we can have in, in annotation space. On the right here, you can see this is a image segmentation task. So we need like this pixel wise uh, localization. So the, the main point is if you if you want your network to, uh, if you want your network to make this kind of prediction, then you will have to provide this kind of annotation as ground truth as well. So that's your labeling cost. Okay, so that's kind of you can say like fully supervised method where whatever you are expecting from your network, you provide the ground truth. And as we have seen, like segmentation is like very costly as compared to your classification task. Okay. So that's one variation where whatever your network is predicting, you have the ground truth. And like MS Coco is one example of uh, such, a, such a data set. Then we can move away from fully supervised, which is called weakly supervised, where what we do is even if your network is actually giving you very fine grained segmentation results, you might not have that in your ground truth. So that's called weakly supervised. So one example, so one example could be, let's say you are doing object detection. But as a ground truth, I don't give you bonding boxes. I only give you image level labels. I only say that, okay, a car is present in this image, but don't tell you where exactly it is. So it's kind of weak supervision. And uh, you have like a lot of variations. Again, uh, ImageNet is one. And then unsupervised is you don't have anything. You just have a bunch of images and you have to learn. Okay, so these are different variations. And of course, like uh, as you go towards right, you need more annotation. As you go towards left, you will uh, need like less uh, less amount of annotation. And again, this kind of varies. Like the definition varies from task to task. I just give an example of one task, but that that is kind of you can generalize to other tasks as well. Okay, so now we have briefly talked about uh, features. We need features to train model. We need labels to train model, and this is the actual training part. And then the question is, what exactly is this model, and how exactly we are training this? And I have the the, the rest part of this lecture will cover what this model is, and then I have another lecture which will talk about how we train that model. Okay. So that model you can actually represent a, as a function, and what exactly is happening? you are sending your images as an argument or you can say like input to your function and what that model is trying to do is it's giving you some kind of output for example if it's a classification task it's giving you the class label okay so whatever that model is it doesn't matter you can represent that as a function it will always hold okay if you give like an image of tomato it's going to give you tomato Okay. So whatever machine learning framework or whatever model you have, doesn't matter whether it's convolutional neural network, it's a recurrent neural network, it's just like a very simple machine um, MLP. You can say that it's a function which takes some input and predicts some output. Okay, so that's a very generalized form. Now the question is what this function is that defines your model, and we'll we'll come to that later. Okay, so this x could be your image. If you're using pixel level values, this could be features if you're trying to use local features. All right. So this is your, uh, let's say, classifier function. That's the output label. Okay. So the training phase is, uh, as, as, as we discussed, like in, in training set, you have a lot of images and you will have labels uh, for those images. So you can describe your training set as uh, this set here. 
where x1 to xn, xn is like your set of images, all right? And these could be also features if you are using local features. So, and then for each image, you will have some kind of ground truth or some kind of annotation. Okay, so you need this pair. Now what will happen is for each image or each feature, you will pass this as input to the function. It will make some prediction and you will match that prediction to this ground truth. And depending upon how good that matches, then you're going to perform the training. Okay, so that's a high level uh, idea of how the training is being performed. Okay, so the, the idea is whatever prediction this network makes, like this one y over here, you try to minimize the gap between this prediction and the actual ground truth. Okay, you want them to be very close or you want them to be exactly the same, which never happens, but that's what you want. And you do that for all the samples. And that's essentially your training. Okay, so if, if you remember like something from your numerical like uh, mathematics in your high school, this is kind of kind of optimization. Okay, so you're trying to optimize your model based on what is predicting and you want that prediction to be very close to the ground truth. Okay, so once that process is done, you have optimized your network or your, you have optimized your function, then testing is simply you just send like unseen samples to that function and it will just make predictions. Okay, so that's a train model. In this one, we'll try to understand some of the basics of neural network. Uh, what's the motivation, like from where the intuition is coming. So if we, we have like neurons in, in our brain and this is the structure of a neuron and we don't have to fully understand it, uh, understand this. I will just try to explain like what, what, uh, what, what is our understanding of uh, these neurons in our brain. So we have this like a uh, cell region. Okay, so this is called the nucleus or also the cell body. And then we have a lot of like uh, these arms kind of thing. So these are called, these are called, these are called termi uh, terminals. So we have synapses here and then we have dendrites. Okay, and then we have, we have this exon. So we're interested in these four elements from the uh, neurons at this point, the cell body, the dendrites arm, the exon, and the synapses, okay? So what happens is your neurons take activations or some kind of like neural activity you can say, or some, some signal and it flows through the dendrites and it goes through your uh, nucleus and there is like some kind of operation which happens, some kind of mathematical operation you can say, which we truly don't understand, but it can be approximated using let's say averaging or summing. So in a way, this cell is actually, or this neuron is getting a lot of signals from all these dendrites, right, as input. And then there is some function which takes all these uh, input signals and do some mathematical operation. Let's assume that's uh, just averaging. So it will average all those, uh, all those activations. And then that uh, activation is actually flowed through this exon. And what will happen if, if we receive like a very high activation function, or you can say like a very strong signal from, from these dendrites, then the signal will flow and then it will be passed to a different cell or a different neuron. And this has happened, this happens like through this synapses. Okay, and if the activation is not high, I mean, it's, it's very weak, then it won't pass through or it won't flow through this exon. So that's like a very basic uh, operation which happens uh, in, our, uh, in our neurons. And that's the basic intuition of a neural network as well, okay? So the brain is composed of like several, uh, several, several neurons. And as I said, like they receive a neuron from, uh, they receive input from uh, the dendrites, these arms over here. And approximately it's like summed at this uh, region. And if it's if it exceeds like some kind of threshold, then it will pass to the next cell. Otherwise, there will be no neural activity. Now, those were like uh, let's say biological models. And if we if we try to connect multiple uh, neurons, and what we try to do is we try to create artificial models and we try to connect these uh, neurons together, we try to build these neural nets. So this is kind of a simulation kind of uh, environment. And this is like also called an artificial system, okay? And the idea is with this very simple operation, 
where the neuron is actually taking signal from like multiple locations and performing very simple operation and then deciding whether to pass forward this signal or not. The simple operation can actually help you build very, very sophisticated computational models. And that's how you build your neural networks. Okay. And the, the, the idea is to approximate human, human brain, but again, that's a goal. I mean, we are not uh, anywhere close to that. So let, let's try to compare like uh, some of the statistics from human brain and the computer we have. And some of these might have changed today because the, the field is progressing so fast. But of course, like the from from the left column, like the properties of the brain, uh, it, it won't change. Uh, it won't change because it's based on like our understanding of our brain. So we roughly have two hundred billion neurons and thirty-two trillion uh, trillion of synapses. And comparing that with a computer system, your neurons is like same as the RAM you have, all right, which actually used to perform processing or any kind of computation. And one billion is like roughly a, a number, I mean, it can be much higher or much smaller depending upon what kind of device you have. And you can have trillions of bytes of disk space where you store your information, okay? Computing like the energy use brain, um, it's assumed to be like around 25 watt and energy watt, again, it depends on what kind of system you have. It could be anywhere from 30 watts to 90 watts. In terms of processing speed in brain, uh, based on like an uh, understanding, it's roughly 100 hertz but the computers mean they are much, much faster, okay? And this is a very interesting aspect. Our brain, it can actually work in parallel, distributed, and again, we know like uh, the, the female part, like it, it's, it's actually very, very efficient in performing multiple tasks at the same time. And based on my uh, personal experience, I have uh, seen that a lot. And males like the male counterparts, it's, it's not that easy. I mean, usually we focus on one thing and then we don't know what's happening in our surroundings. On the other hand, computers, like it's it's always serial, it's centralized system. Uh, there is one system which actually, which, which, which tries to control everything. Okay, so it's not distributed or, or parallel. Brain is like fault tolerant and if something goes wrong, I mean, we can still handle it. Okay, we can easily do the damage control, but in case of computers, it's, it's very hard to make them fault tolerant. Brain, of course, we know it learns. It has some kind of learning capability. Computers, we are still like going in that direction, but we, we can't really say that it's learning or what, what exactly is happening. Okay, so we have intelligence. Uh, the brain is actually conscious. Computers, no. Some might argue, but still, from my personal experience, uh, what, I, what I have seen, we are still far away from this intelligence and conscious. Okay, so let's try to understand, given that structure of neuron, which comes from like a brain, how we can compute like this kind of operation mathematically. And that will be the foundation of your neural network. Okay, so this is the neural structure, which uh, we just discussed. That's the cell, the nuclei. And these are the dendrites from where the signals are actually flowing in and going to, uh, through the exon. And depending upon whether the strength is sufficient or not, it will flow out to the exons to, to the next neuron. Now, what we can do is we can take these as parameters, like as input data points, right? Let's say we have X1 to Xn uh, different input signals. And corresponding to each input signal, we have some kind of weight. And that weight is represented by, let's say, this arrow over here, right? And then as an operation, what we try to do is we try to sum all these signals using these weights. Now, if you remember from like the concept of linear combination, what exactly we are trying to do is we are taking a linear combination of these input signals using these weights. So each of this weight will be multiplied with the signal and will be added to the uh, weighted multiplication of the next signal, right? And whatever output we get, then we try to test whether this is like sufficient or not. If it's sufficient, it will pass. If not, it won't pass. Okay, so let's try to uh, understand how we can uh, write this in a mathematical uh, formulation. So if your input is like going from xi to xn, and this wiwj, wij is like your, uh, is your weight for each of these input uh, signal, then this is kind of, the weighting of one signal, uh, and then if you add like this summation point here, this is the weighted average of all the data points. 
and that's going to give you this activation value okay so this is again uh, you you might have uh, understood this is just like a linear combination of all these signals okay so it's it's very important to understand here x is the signal okay so the signal will vary from image to image it will depend upon what your input is on the other hand these weights these weights are independent of your input these weights are the property of your of your cell or your nuclei all right and these weights are something which we try to learn so this process is going to give this activation and to figure out whether like this is uh, strong enough or not we try to use activation function of course there are other motivation to use activation function we'll talk about that as well so for example like sigmoid function this is one activation function that's a simple equation and this activation value will go through uh, this function you can just put it here and whatever the output is that is going to be the output of this particular neuron okay which will go to the next neuron so again just to recap these are input signals these are the weights independent of your input signal these are property of your nuclei or you can say I mean if you're trying to learn a model these are property of your model okay so you are not learning these input values you are learning these weights these input values will change with your sample and then you have some kind of operation which is linear combination of these signals and this is your activation function and the output going to the next cell okay so this this basic building block which i showed you this is called a perceptron and this was invented like way back in 1957 and it can be used to perform a simple task like linear class uh, linear classification all right and the weights which i was showing you uh, you, you can represent that as a vector and we also need a bias i will uh, talk about like why we need bias later but we we do need a bias and the idea is so this is like the basic building block of your uh, of your perceptron and again these are your input signals this is your neuron or your perceptron which will have these values so you know like these all three weights which you which you will use to actually uh, find the importance of these signals so in addition to this you also have a bias okay and bias solves like many purposes one simple intuition is your input signal might be coming from different ranges right so depending upon that you need like some bias term so that uh, if if your some of your signals are getting filtered out you you don't want that okay so you're just trying to add like that value to your signal so which means to say that okay for your input signal whatever it is your activation will be at least this amount okay so it's kind of a starting point for your for your signals so that's one interpretation of course there are a lot of this and as we uh, as we move uh, as we will move forward in the course we will see like how this is used and to, to be frank I mean, even if you don't use it we have seen it doesn't matter but again don't don't try to like worry about it like uh, uh, what that means but just just to give you an idea okay but initially when when these were proposed we had these bias these biases okay so if you want to represent this uh, as a in, in a mathematical term you what you can do is you can represent like these weights as as a vector right and b is just a number it's a bias term and this operation over here this is uh, you can say like a dot product between this weight vector and the input vector and i guess this this again this input vector is like set of these values all right and you know that uh, from the basics which we have covered in linear algebra this dot product is going to give you just like uh, element wise multiplication of x1 w1 x2 w2 right and you just sum those up and at the end you will add this bias and what you're going to do is if this value over here whatever this mathematical formulation is if it's negative you say the signal is very weak and if it's positive you say okay the signal is strong and you will pass through okay so that's one way the other way you can say is that if the output of this formulation is negative and you are trying to use this perceptron to solve let's say image classification which says whether object is present or not then you can interpret in that way you can say that okay if it's negative object is not present 
and if it's positive object is present so that way you can use like the simple formulation to solve your classification task all right and of course you can just uh, uh, so this is dot product again as i said a uh, linear combination of different input signals now to use this uh, let's let's a, take a simple example let's say we have an image uh, of resolution 28 cross 28 and this is a grayscale image now what we can do is we can convert it to a vector so in total we'll have like 784 uh, different elements or 784 different pixels and let's say that's our input vector so it will have like this dimension and this represents x which means that this is pixel level representation which we were discussing earlier all right so your input vector x now has 784 different values now in your neuron then you need like wait for each of this input signal right so if you represent that uh, neuron as w which again will be a vector of weights then it should have 784 different weights and again you can represent that as a matrix or you can say like a single single vector right and b is like a bias so biases usually you will have one bias for each perceptron okay now what you can do is as as we saw in the previous slide you just take dot product of x and w and add the bias okay and if you do the math here uh, for the for the shape of like uh, this operation this is the dimension of x this is the dimension of y so this is going to give you just one number right that will be one cross one and we just add the bias so essentially you can represent this perceptron using this simple equation and this is kind of parametric because x could be like of any dimension and depending upon that you will have dimension set for w okay so this simple equation tells you how a simple perceptron will work so of course that was like a let's say a binary classifier which was saying whether object is present or not what if you have a set of cl uh, classes right you can have three different classes now what you can do is for each class you can add a neuron okay so let's say this is your input vector you have three different uh, values here and for each class you have this perceptron now and each perceptron will tell you whether that class is present or not so then you can solve like your multi class classification problem the operations won't change but the only thing is for each perceptron you will have that many parameters right all the arrows coming in because for each perceptron, you're going to take linear combination of your inputs. And for each neuron uh, perceptron over here, you will have different set of weights. So th those weights are not shared here. Okay, so let's try to understand how that will change the uh, mathematical formulation. Your input vector is not going to change. It will still be one cross 784. Your weight matrix will change. Earlier, you had just one perceptron. So you needed like just 784 different values. But let's say you are solving a 10 class classification problem, which means you have 10 different object categories. For that, you will need 10 different perceptrons. So, which means the number of parameters you need is 784 times 10. Okay, so one for each perceptron. So again, you can represent that as a matrix. And if you will, uh, if you'll try to follow, again, for each perceptron, you will have a bias. So in this case, you have 10 perceptrons that will give you. 10 different biases so bias again you can represent as a vector one cross 10 and your equation will not change it will still be x times w plus b in this case your uh, w is not like a vector it's a matrix but again if you do the math and if you remember like uh, how we did matrix multiplication this is again going to give you 10 different numbers all right so at the end, you will get 10, uh, 10 values, and each value will represent uh, one class. So in this case, one thing uh, uh, is, uh, like important, which is important is, this is not your network parameter. This is input. These are your network parameters. Okay. So these uh, W matrices, which are storing weights, which you are actually taking, which you are using to compute the linear combination, those are the parameters which are actually learned when you when you train your model 
we can simplify it further. So here it's a little I mean, not complicated, but just from like uh, computation convenience. Let's say we don't want to perform any addition. So what we can do is, and it's just a hack when I mean, you don't have to do this. So what you can do is you can move the bias inside your weights, right? And then you can add one more input and you can hard code that as one. Now, what will happen is if this B is the bias, it will be multiplied by one, right? So it will still be B, but now you can represent that as a parameter in your network, which is your weight. And then your operation is simplified. You don't need any summation because you don't have like B outside of your matrix multiplication. Now that was like just clubbing different uh, perceptrons uh, together. But of course, what you can do is you can perform composition of these different set of uh, perceptrons. And each set is called a layer. In this case, uh, let's say you have this as input and this is your input layer. You have three perceptrons here. And what, what you can do is whatever output you get from these perceptrons, you can add one more layer of these per perceptrons. And this, in this case, you have four. And then you can have like your final output layer, which is just a uh, one neuron, which means you're just trying to solve binary classification. Okay, so you can ma make like these networks deeper and deeper. And the idea is like you want to represent complex functions using composition of smaller functions. Okay, again, to, to note that uh, these are your input weights are actually these arrows which are going from, which are actually, which are transforming your input layer by layer. And the number of weights you have will depend upon these neurons. Okay, so in this simple network, if you have to count the number of parameters, then you just count these edges because those are the weights of your network. So in this case, this is layer one, this is layer two, this is layer three, which is again the output layer as well. Okay, this is sometimes called hidden layer. Again, this is hidden layer two. You can also call this input layer. Then your final layer, this is also called output layer. And essentially all of these operations, as we discussed earlier, it's just matrix multiplication, which makes it very efficient. And we are we use like GPUs to uh, train these models. And GPUs, like we have very, very efficient uh, matrix multiplication operations and that's why training these models is easier in gpus okay and these matrices are actually the weights of your network as i said earlier so let's start the lecture and this is like continuation of the previous lecture where we were talking about neural networks and this segment we are going to talk about non-linearity so right now we have just looked into how we connect like set of neurons to different set of neurons and how like the, the data is propagated in a, in a network like from the input to the output so first we will see like uh if we don't have non-linearity in your network then how that reduces to like a single layer irrespective of how many layers you have in your network okay so let, let's uh, uh talk about that first and then we'll talk about like how we can introduce non-linearity in, in your network now we have seen like uh each layer you can define as a function, all right? And that function is, uh, as we know, like the linear combination of all the values in your input, you use like the weights, like to compute that linear, uh, compute that linear, uh, linear combination, right? So that's, that gives you like a value for one of the neuron and you have several of those neurons. So you keep doing that, okay? So you can represent that operation as a function so let's say hx is that function and that represents one of the layer. Now, what will happen is this layer is again going to give you another set of neurons, right? So you have the input, you have this current layer, you will perform that linear combination for all the neurons. And then again, this, this set of neurons can act as input to the next layer, right? And if the next layer is again like a set of neurons, you can represent that as let's say function x, uh, sorry, func function f. Right. So the output of HX is then is, is like treated as input to your function F and you can keep doing that. So in this case, uh, we have like two uh, uh, 
two layers h is the first one f is the second one and g is the output the output of a classifier okay of course so this is like just two functions but you can compose many many functions to make your networks deeper now the issue is if you have this kind of compositionality it doesn't matter how many functions you have or how many layers you add like on top of each other at the end it just reduces to a single function all right so let's let's go through that how uh, how that's the case so in this case we have just one layer right so we have an input of three uh, uh three dimensions x1 x2 x3 and your layer has four neurons and these arrows are your weights all right so to get the value of like uh this neuron you will compute like a weighted uh average or you can say like a linear combination of all these inputs by the weights so all not all weights are shown here because like from each uh from from each input value you should have an arrow to like all of the uh, other neurons right right now like for example like x2 arrow from x2 to, to this neuron is not shown okay so that's how you will get output of this first layer all right and then again you have a, a single neuron which is like your output Again, what it's doing is it's just taking linear combination of output of all these neurons. Okay. So kind of like you just have one function and one output layer. And a simple way to represent uh, this neural network is this equation. And we have seen this equation before. Uh, Z over here is the output. W is like the weights. Okay, so let's say this is uh, one represents like a uh, layer one. So this Z, if it's Z1, it's like output of uh, this layer. It's not the final output. And B1 is the biases. Okay, it's a vector and you will have one value for each of these neurons. X is your input vector. So it will be a vector of uh, dimensionality three. It will have three values. And this weight matrix is basically all the weights you have in this layer. Okay, it will be a matrix because you will have a, you will have a column or a row for each neuron right so it will be kind of a three cross four uh, matrix here and you can take like a linear combination of those weights with this input and that's good and you add those with the bias the bias like corresponding biases that's going to give you these four values all right and those four values are represented by the z okay so now what you can do is you can add another layer on top of this and let's say like the weights of those layers is this uh, matrix w so the subscript, the superscript here too represents like a second layer. Okay, and these are the biases of the second layer. These are the weights, and you can see like the input to this layer is actually output of the first layer, the C1. And again, this Z2 is output of the second layer, and you can keep doing that. All right. So now let's try to see what happens if we have a lot of lot of these layers and how that reduces to just a single layer. All right. So let's say we have this neural network which has two layers. So this is the first layer. This is the second layer. Now what you can do is you can uh, you can try to solve this equation. Uh, the second equation over here, you just replace like this z1 with the actual value, right? This value over here. So we replace this z1 with this value, which is coming from the first equation. Now you can see that this is a weight matrix this is a weight matrix you can just do the multiplication and open braces so again this is going to give you a matrix multiplication you will have x here and then again these are set of weights you multiply that with this uh, column vector b which has which is set of biases and again you have this uh, biases which was already outside of this bracket now if you multiply these two matrices that's again going to be like some matrix right these are weights and if you multiply this this is again going to give you just a column vector and if you add that column vector to this column vector, again, it's going to be like some vector, which again will be a column vector. Let's name that B. And whatever output you're getting from multiplication of these two matrices, let's call that W. Okay, so you can see that the formulation is exactly same as a single layer. Right? So even if you add like two layers, but if you try to solve that, it reduces to a single layer. So which means that it doesn't matter how many layers you add, it's still going to be a single layer neural network okay so let's see how we can uh, resolve this, this issue okay 
Yeah, so th that was the one issue. Like, uh, if you don't have non-linearity in your network, uh, it just doesn't matter like how many layers you have. It is equivalent to a single layer. The other issue is in your linear classifier, what you want is if, if you're making like small changes to your input data or your input sample, right? So you would want like very small amount of changes in your, your response, network's response, right? Because you're not changing a lot. So your results should also not change a lot. But in neural network, usually uh, what happens is if, if you change like a very small, uh, 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 if you change your input with a very small amount, what will happen is you might see like a very high response in your output. And that could be due to maybe the weights you have in your network, right? And like the, the kind of uh, step function you're using maybe as, as activation, right? So that's not a good property. And we, we want to control that. Ideally what we want is, if you're changing like input with a very small amount, we should observe a very small amount of change in the network's prediction as well. Okay, so ideally, like if you're changing like with a very small amount, you should see a very small amount. So let, let's see how we can introduce non-linearities into our network and that will try to resolve both these issues. The first one is like, if you have multiple layers, then it's kind it, it it will help you like in building a complex function so that's one motivation why you why should have like multiple layers in your network okay so let's not now try to understand how these non linearities can be introduced and a easy way to is like use activation functions whatever output you have in your neural network like in one of the layers you apply these activation function which is kind of it has different meanings so sometimes it, it tries to like limit the value value of that activation and maybe maybe enforce that it should only lie in a certain range okay and mostly activation function does that sometimes mean you could have different variations as well but you try to limit like what the range can be okay so there are like several several examples of activation functions which you can use and sigmoid function is one of them so if you look at the equation of sigmoid function it will look uh, something like this all right, so it's, it's one over this one plus exponent of negative of whatever input value you have. And the idea of sigmoid function is whatever value your function can have, it will always limit the value between zero and one. Okay, so the output will always be in this range. And it's very useful actually in, uh, when, when you train your neural networks, if you want to limit the value between zero and one, it has a lot of like other significance as well. But let, let's try to understand like uh, what, what's happening here. So this is like the curve uh, uh, of the sigmoid function. And the, the input to this function, the Z is like the values in the X axis. Okay, so Z is your X axis. And you can see if you put a value of zero here, you will roughly get 0.5. And if you increase the value, the value is going to increase. And if you go to infinity, then the value will be capped at one. So you can see that pretty, pretty soon, like at value of four, five or six, it's kind of saturating at one. And same is the case if you go to the left and make it negative. So somewhere around negative five or maybe negative something, it's, it's actually going close to zero. And it doesn't matter what's the value of Z after that, beyond that, it could be negative infinity. It, still be, uh, it will still be zero. Okay, so the idea is you are actually, if you're moving away from this uh, center position zero, you can see like it's increasing gradually. And then it's like going to saturate after some time. Okay, so you can see this, this increase is not linear. A linear uh, increase will be like a straight line, right? So this is kind of a non-linear uh, transformation. Initially it's increasing like rapidly, then it's actually saturating. And similarly, when you're actually decreasing the value, it's actually going down rapidly, but then again, saturating at zero. So this le non-linearity is introduced when you pass your activations through this activation function. All right. So what you do is after each layer, you apply the sigmoid activation. And after each layer, then the function is actually turning into non-linear function. All right. So sigmoid was one. Similarly, we can have a tanh activation. Uh, the idea here is uh, instead of zero and one, you limit between negative one and uh, one. And it more or less like it looks like a sigmoid function. 
Okay, but there are some differences, like you can see the rise and drop is more uh, like drastic as compared to sigmoid. Uh, then you have ReLU. This is this is interesting, and you can see like if if your if the value of your activation is or or the output of your neuron is positive, what this says is you you just keep that value, and that could be infinity as well. Right? So you can see like you, you don't have non-linearity when the value is positive. You just keep that value. So that's linear. But the interesting part is if the value is negative, then you will clip that value to zero. So you won't consider any value which is negative. You'll just make it to zero. And that actually is introducing non-linearity in, in your network. Right? So the perceptron model we, we discussed in the last lecture, and there are a lot of interesting uh, aspects of this. It's well grounded in theory. Uh, of course, we are not going to cover uh, most of this. If you're interested in like the theoretical aspect of this, I will refer you to this book. Uh, the other interesting as aspect of perceptron is the, the perceptron can actually represent a NAND circuit. If you remember like what a NAND circuit is from your uh, electronics or maybe some, some electronics courses, right? You might have seen this. And you know that NAND is like something which you can use to compose like any binary function, right? Which means that if you can build a NAND circuit out of a perceptron, then you can build any binary function using your perceptron, which is quite interesting, okay? So ideally, not just binary function, if you have a lot of, lot of parameters, sufficient amount of parameters, your neural networks can actually approximate any function, any function you write, you, you can represent that as a neural network. So that's the that's the power of neural, neural networks. Now this neural network it's it's not something new. The the earliest one was proposed in I think nineteen fifty seven, and this is like the uh, hardware uh, for for that. And I think it's it's very complicated hardware. You can see like uh, I think there were these I think are the uh, yeah it's providing the power I think. But you should, I think, look at this. This this one called like Mark One perceptron. At that time, it was very. Uh, there were there were a lot of arguments about this, and I didn't mean they 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 just created like twenty cross twenty image. I mean, if if you think about this, it it just has has like four hundred pixels, right? So it's a, it's a very small image, but still like it it required that that big uh, hardware, right? So all these wires are kind of I think the the activations to simulate like the the input to the network. So that's what it uh, looked like back then in 1957. Since then, like a lot of uh, improvements have been made. And these days I mean you can create your neural networks with billions, billions of parameters, right? So as I said, like a single layer network. Uh, yeah, so this is also interesting. We, we are talking about like adding multiple layers to your neural network, right? But theoretically, you can just have a single layer network, just one layer. And if you have enough parameters, which means like if you have a lot of, lot of parameters or many neurons in that layer, you can approximate like any function. Okay? The only issue is like, it will require a lot of parameters and we don't want that. And the reason is, uh, that's, that's like one of the reasons we want to go deeper. And again, if you're going deep, we, we are having like multiple layers. Of course, we, we can approximate any function we want. And we will we'll also optimize in terms of number of neurons we require. So the idea is if you have like multiple layers, you can actually treat that as like composition and you can reuse those compositions, right? So for example, if you have like a layer or a set of layers, which are trying to learn some kind of functionality and it could be like that functionality is required like multiple times when you're trying to approximate a function. So, so you can reuse that, okay? So if you are uh, if you're creating a deeper network, it's allowing you to like, uh, to use that compositionality and it's it's kind of reducing that redundancy when you have just a single layer network. Okay. So that's good. So you, you might have heard of like MLP. It's just like a, a neural network with several layers stacked on top of each other. And after each layer, you will have these nonlinear activation functions. Okay. So to, to each of these outputs, you will apply these activation functions. So this kind of structure is called a multi-layer perceptron. And you will use this term like uh, multiple times in the course. 
And this is also called a feed forward network. And sometimes you will see, I mean, even like people use a term neural network for this, which is also fine. Okay, so with this, like the goal is we, we want to approximate like complex functions and the kind of architecture which you develop that will depend upon the, 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 the problem you're trying to solve. If your problem is very trivial, then you don't want to build like a very big neural network, right? Or a very big MLB. You might consider like few neurons, very small set of layers. So it depends like what kind of problem you are dealing with. Uh, that will that will lead to like the design choices you will uh, use for constructing your neural networks. Okay. Now, before uh, before talking about like how to train these neural networks or like the, uh, the next topic, I will show you like some results of these MLPs on a standard benchmark data set. So this data set is called MNIST and uh, this data set has like uh, binary uh, digits, grayscale images, something like this. Okay, so you have nine, uh, 10 different digits. So it has like a lot of, lot of different variations of these, uh, these digits. And they are roughly, I think 60 or uh, 60K training samples. And you have around 10,000 testing samples. And these are very small images, uh, 28 cross 28. So if you build like a very simple six layer multi-layer perceptron, which we described like uh, earlier, then if you use like these many neurons, first layer has around 2,500 neurons, then this next one, 2,000, 1,500, and then 10 neurons at the end because you have 10 different classes. So this is like the final layer. Then using this kind of structure actually performs really well and you can achieve a performance of 99% on, on this data set. Okay, I mean, this is not a very complex data set. Uh, it's 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 a simple one, but still, this level of performance actually is a uh, pretty good. So that's the power of neural network. And if if you think about this, you have like a total of ten thousand total uh, testing samples, right? And an accuracy of ninety nine point six five means you are only uh, missing around like thirty five samples, right? So you are making wrong predictions only on 35 samples out of these 10,000 samples, which is, which is quite impressive. But now the question is, if neural networks are that powerful, why, why exactly we need convolutional neural networks, which is like the next lecture, uh, which, which we are going to cover today. Uh, let me give you like a brief uh, motivation for that, why exactly we need convolutional neural network. So neural network, uh, as I said, these are like fully connected layers. This is like, a name uh, you will also see are uh, being used for MLPs. You will have input, right? Then you will have some input layer, hidden layer, output layer. So this is like a very general structure of your, your neural network. Now, if you think about this, the number of weights you have in your first layer, it depends upon how many neurons you have in this layer. So that's one factor. And we, we saw that in the pop quiz, right? And it also depends upon how many dimensions you have in your input data. If it's small, then it's fine, we can, we can build it. But if the number of inputs you have in your signal, it's too high, that will lead to like a lot of parameters here. Okay, so let's see like a very simple example. So if you use image as input, then let's say your, uh, your height and width of, of your images like H and W, let's say these are 256, 256. And then C is for channels. So it's colored image, then it will have like three, three different channels. So if you send like this image directly as input to this neural network, then this image has these many values. Okay, this is approximately like 200K, which means that even if you use, let's say 10 neurons, which is actually quite few like for this big image that will lead to like 2 million parameters here, which is a lot. And the reason is like for each neuron, you have to learn weights corresponding to all the dimensions you have in your input. Okay. So that's one of the limitation uh, why neural networks are not generally used for uh, image uh, images when, when images are input because the dimension, uh, the dimensionality is too high. 
Okay, so that's one of the limitations. The other limitation is, I mean, of course, you don't have to use like the pixel values. You can actually use handcrafted features, and we're going to talk about these features as well. But the issue is the performance of this neural network will then be limited by like what kind of features you are using. If your features are not good, then your network will have like limited capability. All right. So now let's see how CNN resolves this issue. And of course, we have a full lecture on this, how CNN works. So if you don't understand any part of this, don't worry about it. We are going to cover everything in detail in the next lecture. So CNN is, uh, it's called convolutional neural network. And the like one of the ways it differs from neural network is when it's trying to learn these weights, these weights are actually not specific to your input data. All right. So these kind of neural networks try to share those weights across all the input uh, input locations. And the way they operate is so your neural networks are actually working on your flat end input, right? So it's always like one dimensional, uh, or you can say like a flat end. Uh, single dimensional input and that's your input and that's always your output. But with CNN, you always deal with volumes. So your input will be volume. So this is your image, let's say height and width and these three channels. And from a volume, you go to a volume. And again, you keep like transforming volumes to volumes and at the end you will get the results. And while you do so, what happens is when you're operating on any part of this input data, it could be anywhere like at the input space or like the feature space, you are actually sharing the weights across these locations. Okay, if, if it's not clear, don't worry about it. Just try to understand that we are sharing weights. How we are sharing weights, well, we'll cover that later. So if you're sharing weights, then it means that it doesn't matter how big your input data is or how big your input image is, because you will use the same set of weights for different locations. So your weights will not increase. So your weights are actually kind of independent of what kind of input data you're using, all right? So that allows your CNN to operate on like big images, which uh, we saw I mean was very difficult for neural networks. And so that's like the, the basic uh, difference between CNN and MLP. But being said that, don't underestimate the power of neural networks. So I'm just going to show you one very interesting example. And this is very recent uh, ongoing research. Uh, people have started like working on this topic. So this concept of NERF, uh, most of you might have heard of this, was introduced in 2020. And since then, people have like uh, have been like working uh, a lot in, in this direction. So the idea here is, if you have like a discrete view of any object, right? Which means that, let's say, if you have some images of this object from different viewpoints, but you don't have the continuous space, the full 360 degree view. So what this kind of models can do is it can generate like this continuous 3D space for you, which is quite impressive. So some of these views were not even like present in your input signal. And you can say like maybe interpolation or some kind of transformation, your network was able to do that, right? So same is the case with the second one with like very few examples from different like discrete viewpoints as input, it was able to generate uh, this continuous 360 degree view. And in, in this work, like uh, MLPs were used. Of course, I mean, recently we have seen like CNNs can also be used, but initially MLPs were used and the results I'm showing, this was actually using MLP. So it, it's not that MLPs are not used today. I mean, they still are uh, used a lot. Okay, so this is like uh, one of the impressive results uh, which, which we have. 